Bibles with me again to 1 Samuel. All righty then. I heard of somebody's cell phone. Maybe it's just my imagination running away with me. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 1, commencing in verse number 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Then the man El Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she had said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull and ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. To this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. This is in verse 10, 28. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Thank you. You may have your seat. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. A wise mother. This woman, Hannah, is a wise mother. I mentioned in the early service that Hannah was married to a man named Elkanah under some very difficult circumstances. Hannah, who was Elkanah's wife, could not bear him children. And so Elkanah married a second woman named Penina. And Penina bore him sons and daughters. But there was a jealousy, a rivalry between the two of them because Elkanah loved Hannah and Penina knew it. But Hannah could not bear him children. And so Penina had these sons and daughters. And the scripture says she daily vexed Hannah. She teased her. She ridiculed her. 
She tore her down. She was constantly agitating and, and making mess and confusion. Even that name Penina sounds like a messy person. She made confusion in that house. There was always strife, always difficulty on Penina's part because Hannah never answered her a word. The Bible says year in and year out, she needled her and teased her and, and provoked her because Hannah is a woman of God and Penina is crude and crass. She's common and silly. And she's always making small of Hannah and tearing her down because she can't have any children. That's a difficult household to live in. But Hannah demonstrates to us how to live under pressure and never lose your cool. How to live in daily strife, constant agitation, and just keep on moving. Because Hannah has a weapon that Penina knows nothing about. Yeah. Uh, Penina is always teasing, always chiding her. But Hannah uses that weapon finally. She goes to God in prayer. Yeah. And the only weapon you have against your enemy is prayer. You want to defeat your enemy? Pray. I wish I had a witness here. You want to get the upper hand over your enemy? Pray. You want to stop somebody from bothering you? Pray. Because when you pray and pray right, God will come to your rescue. Somebody ought to help me testify that God will come to your rescue. God will stop the mouths of your enemies when you don't fight fire with fire but pray for them that despitefully use you. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. If they ask you to go one mile, go two miles. If they steal your coat, give them your cloak. Put your trust in the Lord and God will fight your battle. Hannah would not open her mouth except when they went to the temple and she prayed. And we pick up the story here in verse number 12. Hannah is in the temple praying because her faith, she, she, she has a fight for her faith. She really wants God to hear and answer her prayers because she's making an investment in her family. But now she's making an investment in her faith. And her faith is a practical faith. Her faith is not something ethereal and super mundane. It's not out there in the nether regions of space somewhere. It's practical and in our hands. Because if she can't do anything else to fight Penina, she can pray. And, uh, I, I, I dispute this argument that they've taken prayer out of school. Nobody can stop you from praying. Come on, help me if you can. Uh, they, they might not officially have a time where you can pray in school, but who knows what's in your heart? Who knows what's going on in your mind? Have I got a witness here? Never be too proud to bow your head and give God thanks. I don't care if you're in a restaurant full of people. When they bring your food, thank God for the food you're about to receive. Before you go to bed at night, when you wake up in the morning, pray, tell God, thank you for another day. Brothers and sisters, prayer is a weapon that you can pull out against your enemy. I said prayer is a weapon that you can pull out against your enemy. I wish I had a witness here. The scripture says, fret not yourself. Because of evil doers. Come on, help me preach a minute. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like grass. And they shall wither like the green herb. I need two or three more Bible readers. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, before they got to me, they stumbled and they fell. God will fight your battle. God will make your enemy your footstool. Your weapon is prayer. Let them set traps for you. No weapon sown against you shall prosper. Let them try to trip you up and decide that you're not going to make it another day. God, when he closes a door, he'll open a window and pour out blessings. Somebody ought to help me testify. Anybody try to get you and try to destroy you and try to make some all of you and try to make sure that you didn't advance and then God came right in that situation and just pushed you forward right in their very presence? Because the psalmist says he prepares a table before me, not in a corner somewhere, but in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil so that my cup, I wish I had a witness, is just running over. Surely, goodness, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Hannah had a practical faith. And then Hannah had a personal faith because she's in the temple praying but no words are coming out. Her lips are moving. And brothers and sisters, there are some hurts. There are some pain that is so sore and so raw that you can't even put it in the words. I wish I had some help right here. There's some situation that can so depress you and discourage you that you know how you feel, but you can't get the words out. You ever been there? Crying in the midnight hour, worrying about what the next day was going to bring. And trouble can disorient you. And pain can just take the words right out of your mouth that you know what's going on in your heart, but you can't put it in the words. I'm not talking about a headache now. I'm not talking about a sprained ankle. I'm talking about a problem that you can't do nothing about that nobody can help you but the Lord. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. I'm talking about a situation that is so stressful that you thought you'd never stop crying. You thought the sun would never shine in your life again. And you come to church smiling to keep from crying because you don't want these nosy church folk trying to ask you what's going on in your life. Not because they want to help, but because they want to criticize. It's right here in the text. It's right here in the text. Eli accused Hannah of being drunk, of being a worthless woman. He said, get that strong drink out of here. Take that drunkenness away from him. He misjudges her because he looks at her face, but he doesn't know her heart. How dare you judge me by how I look? You don't know what I went through to get to church this morning. I wish I had somebody to help me. You don't know what the person sitting on the pew with you went through last week to get to this church this morning to let you criticize how they praise God. Here's... Here's the stress in this text. 
He accuses Hannah of being drunk. He criticizes her for her practical personal faith. When his own son are out of control. Isn't that strange? I'm, I'm, I'm sick of the morality police at church who, who got such good morals now that they're in their 80s. <laughs> let, let, let's talk about what you did in your 20s and in your 30s and your 40s. I wish I had somebody to help me here. All of a sudden, you get to be the church police after you can't do nothing no more. Your children are out of control and you try to control somebody else's children. Your life is in a downward spiral and you try to give me some advice. Physician, heal thyself. See how quiet you got right there? Because there are some Eli's in this sanctuary this morning always trying to dampen your enthusiasm and misreading and misjudging your praise. You don't know what it is I'm thanking God for. I'm not crying because nothing is wrong. I'm shouting because God answered my prayer. You ever thought about that? I'm raising my hands because God been good to me. You ever thought about that? I'm giving God the glory because he delivered me. Did that ever cross your mind? I think I think it was the Williams brothers who said sweep around your own front door. Uh, I wish I had a witness. I think it was Jesus said, why are you looking at the, the moat that's in your brother's eye and not considering the beam that's in your own eye? To put it in modern day vernacular, you're looking at a toothpick in my eye and that's a two by four in your eye. Straighten your family out before you give me some familial advice. Straighten your marriage out before you give me some marital advice. Straighten your life out before you try to fix my life, Iyanla. I wish I had somebody to help me. Fix your life, Oprah, before I go to your life class. Stop shacking up with Stedman before you try to fix my life. Listen, listen, listen. I, I, want, I want to get to this. Hannah made sure that Samuel stayed in the church so that he did not have to look for role models outside the church. I'm, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. And her prayer was simply this. Lord, if you give me a son, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. Parents, that's some good advice. Lord, you gave me this boy, now I'm going to give him back to you. Lord, you gave me this girl, now I'm going to give her back to you. I'm going to pray for her. I'm going to ask you to bless her. I'm going to live right in front of him so that he won't have an opportunity to point at me and say, Daddy, you can't tell me nothing. Look at how you live it. I wish I had somebody to help me preach it. You can't tell your children what to do if you don't model it in front of them. My daddy, my daddy used to go to clubs when he was a young man. And he said when his sons, my brothers, got old enough to start going to the clubs, he stayed home. 
He said, because there's no more ugly a sight than a man or woman partying in the streets with their children. Somebody ought to help me preach right here. Parents, stay home with your children and raise them right. You, you have children now. It's not the time for you to find yourself. You should have found yourself before you got married. Or you should have found yourself before you got pregnant. Get off Facebook in your short shorts and, 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 and half naked and you got teenage children embarrassed to call you mama or daddy. See how quiet y'all getting right there? Because you don't have sense enough not to put that stuff in social media. So you're all over the place talking about your man and with pictures of you with a drink in your hand and want to make your children go to Sunday school. See how quiet you're getting again? Now you know I don't care nothing about you getting mad about what I'm preaching. Stop acting a damn fool and stay home with your children and raise them in the fear of God if God gave them to you, give them back to God. And when you can't do nothing with them anymore, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other, no other, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, whether shall I go? Lord, I did the best I could. He's in your hands now. Have I got a witness here? Lord, I live right in front of them. They're in your hands now. Lord, I don't know where they are. Take care of them on the highway. Watch them at the schoolhouse. Make sure they don't put anything in their mouth that I didn't teach them. Help me, oh God, to raise them to love your name. And if you train them up in the way that they should go, the Bible says when they're old, they will not depart from it. Just keep on making investments. Keep on pouring yourself into them. I don't think you can spoil a child by loving them. I don't think you can spoil a child by doing what you ought to do as a parent. I really don't think you can spoil a child by pouring love on them. A father told me after church this morning when I preached this morning about this passage, he said, Pastor, I almost gave up on my son. But I'm not going to give up now. I'm encouraged now to keep on praying for him. And to keep on living right in front of him. Because the word says, if you put it in, he will not depart from it. God will take care of the harvest. You just do the sowing and let God take care of the harvest. You just invest your life in your children and God will reward you. Hannah said, just like you give them to me, I'm giving them back to you. And that's a word to some parent in here this morning. Stop trying to be your child's friend. They got enough friends. Be their authority. Be their parent. Be the one to tell them what to do by how you live. Mm. I was mentioning this morning how dangerous my mother was. No, I, I, don't, I don't mean scary. I mean dangerous. Because I actually believed that my mother was crazy enough to kill one of us. She, she, she meant that when I call you, I don't care where you are, answer me. Don't, don't, don't wait till you get to me to answer me. Answer me wherever you are, let me know you heard me. 
My oldest brother, who's going to be with the Lord, was in college at Grambling. And he was next door at my grandmother's house on the phone, and my mother called him. He's in college. And my mother called him, and he didn't answer. And so when he got next door, my mama said, didn't you hear me calling you? He said, I said I was coming. And immediately, straightway, two teeth came out of his mouth. Because my mother knocked his two teeth out in college. And she said some things that I'm too Christian to repeat. He was a grown man in college and my mother knocked his teeth out. Parents, whipping ain't gonna kill him. Spare the rod. That's what the Bible says. Foolishness is bound up in him, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. My other brother Lee was mad because he wouldn't go to his house and always at somebody else's house, so he wanted us to come to his house Thanksgiving. And we at his house and he had his woman's house. We at his house and he at his woman's house. And so he comes to his woman from his woman's house and comes to his house and my mother's sitting at the head of the table and uh, he slams the door and tells his wife to get up and fix his plate. And he lived in the, in the projects and he used to uh, be the maintenance man in the projects and he took care of the lawn and the grass and everything. And that was a weed eater in the corner in his kitchen. And uh, my mother was at the head of the table and he came in and slammed the door and told his wife to fix his food. My mother got up from the table and straightened herself out. <laughs> got that weed eater in that, out that corner and hit that Negro across his shoulder and almost knocked him out. And he started crying like a little baby, went in the room, and my mother straightened herself up, sat back and finished her dinner. And I went in the room and he said, Terry, my meat was wrong, man. She shouldn't hit me in front of my wife and my children. I said, you're right. Look, she that. I said, go in there and tell her. He said, shh. You out your mind? Parents, stop being scared of your children and make them to know that you are the last word in your house because you live a righteous life in front of them. You missed that second part. I said you are the authority in your house because you live a righteous life in front of them. You can't have a different man coming in every week and then expect to be respected. No, you've got to live the life you sing about in your song. She said, God, if you give them to me, I'm going to give them back to you. And she made Samuel a Nazarite all the days of his life. Now let me get back to this role model stuff I was talking about. She would not let him leave the temple. He became Eli's second right there in the temple because Hannah made sure that no outside influence would be his role model. Somebody ought to help me close here. And one day, Samuel was just sitting down. And the Lord called him. And he went to Eli and he thought Eli had spoken to him. I need some Bible readers to help me close here. And Eli did not respond. Eli said, it wasn't me. Samuel went back and sat down. And the Lord called him again. And he went again to see what it was that Eli wanted. And Eli said, it wasn't me that called you. And God called him one more time. And Samuel said, speak, Lord. I wish I had some noise here. For your servant heareth. Everybody who's in this church right now, some godly person influenced you. 
Thank God for a godly mother. Thank God for a godly grandmother. Thank God for the influence of some man, some woman, somebody prayed for you when you didn't even have sense enough to pray for yourself. Thank God that there was influencers at the church. I'm trying to leave it alone. But my mama prayed for me. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. I don't understand these children talk back to their mama and, and cuss their mama out and come in front of grown people and don't speak, don't open their mouths. That wasn't the way it used to be when we were growing up in our community. Our people made us respect our elders. They made us say, yes ma'am and no sir. If somebody put something in your hand, your mama would say, what you say? You have to say thank you. Have I got a witness here? You wanted something from somebody, you had to say please. If somebody did something for you that they didn't have to, you said I appreciate it. Because your old people made you respect your elders. But now these young folk don't care about nobody or anything. But thank God there's still some good influencers at the church. I said there's some good influence at the church. Bring your children to youth ministry, there's good influence at the church. Bring your children to choir practice. There are still some good people at the church. I know they talk bad about the church and say that the church ain't going to be nothing. But praise God for the church. I said praise God for the church. Samuel could only hear God at the church. Because that's something that goes on at the church. That does not go on at the baseball diamond. You're going to help me close this, won't you? That's something that goes on at the church. That does not go on at the basketball court. Bring your children to church and let them hear amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let your children hear what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. I wish I had somebody who was raised in the church like I was raised. They made you respect the old people in the church. And then they made you get down on your knees and pray. They taught you how to pray a little prayer when you were a child. You're going to help me pray it, won't you? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake I pray the Lord my soul to take that's a pretty good little prayer to pray when you're five and six and seven years old and then when you get in high school and college you start praying to pass an exam you start praying about your relationship with your girlfriend and your boyfriend but then when you get past that foolishness you start praying about your job and you start praying about your children and you start asking the Lord to let you live long enough to raise your son or your daughter give you your health and your strength keep you in your right mind that's the kind of prayer you pray in your 30s and your 40s but when you get up here in your 50s and your 60s you got another prayer to pray when you first wake up in the morning you thank God that you can get up. You thank God that you're still in your right mind. That you got a reasonable portion of your health and your strength. And then by that time, you don't care what nobody thinks about you. You don't care what nobody's opinion is about you. I love the Lord because he heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live, while trouble rise, I will hasten to his throne. Is there anybody here? Know that if you pray and pray right, God will answer your prayer. Is there anybody here? Know if you put your trust in the Lord, he will come to your rescue. Is there anybody here? ever tried my Jesus he's a rock in a weary land he's a shelter in a time of storm he's a friend when you're friendless 
bread when you're hungry water when you're thirsty is there anybody here ever had your back up against the wall and the Lord came to see about you why don't you grab somebody say you don't know what I've been through you don't know how many tears I had to shed you don't know how many burdens I've had to bear I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eye his eye his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watching me shake somebody's hand tell them I tried it for myself I know him for myself I know him he's a heart fixer he's a mind regulator he's a bad he's a burden bearer have you tried him I said have you tried him come on help me praise his name help me shout a minute Help me give God the praise. Hallelujah. 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 I know he's all right. with me he tells me that I am his own and the joy do you have joy the joy that we share I know he's alright I can't help it. I can't help it. I can't help it because I was so moved by this. I was so moved by this that I wept in my house when I heard Kevin Durant of the Oklahoma Thunder praise his mother for feeding them when she didn't eat for keeping them off the streets. And he dedicated to her his most valuable player award in the NBA. But I know another most valuable player. That somebody loves me more than my mother, more than my father. Somebody loves me so much that one Friday on a cross, he died for me. And Jesus is my MVP. I, I don't look for role models outside the church. There are still godly men and women who come to church who can be an example for your sons and for your daughters. You want your children to have a sense? Bring them to the church. And you watch what the world is doing, conspiring with the devil. Every sporting event that children are involved in, they put it on Sunday. So that the parents and the children can't come to church. Because you're involved in the nutcracker and 
and you're involved in dance and you're involved in basketball and softball and everything that takes you away from church. And then you find out that these people who are over these organizations are homosexual or lesbian or they thieves and, and just got out of prison. These people are not your children's role model. Bring them to the house of God. Because there's help and hope in the house of God. And then if there's no man or woman you can look up to at the church, there's Jesus who stands ready to make of himself an example. So much so, he demonstrated his love for you and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died.